Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. Today, T.R. Eckler and I are going to tackle pericarditis and myocarditis. And before we jump into that discussion, I just want to remind you how fantastic EB Medicine really is. On the website today, you'll be able to see a CME map. You can find your state, however many states it is that you're licensed in, and click on them to see the individual criteria that you need for CME for that state and how EB Medicine will fulfill that for you. And in addition, you'll see resources for adult emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and urgent care medicine, all there available for you at the website and our brand new interactive clinical pathways that will guide you step-by-step step through the decisions that you're making, along with all of the other wonderful courses we have for trauma, lacerations, EKG interpretation, neuroemergencies, you name it, we've got it at ebmedicine.net, and you should be going there today. And also, don't forget the mobile app that puts all of those resources at your fingertips. The Pathways product is still in beta, which means it's free to use. We have over 70 Pathways published and more coming on a regular basis. So clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net becomes your resource for that bedside support as you're trying to make those critical decisions. And that's it. Let's jump into the episode. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back today. It is me, Sam Ashu, and T.R. Eckler. I'm back, and I'm excited to be here. Today we are talking about the July Emergency Medicine Practice article on pericarditis and myocarditis in the emergency department. T.R., you ever seen any of these cases before in your practice? Like a number. I remember one patient who had a radiation-induced pericarditis and I think almost to the point of myocarditis as well, that would keep coming back in because the radiation oncologist didn't believe that that's what was causing it. And I've had a couple of, of infectious ones of these when I was in residency and then some autoimmunes. And I find it's just, it's a great challenging test of how much you trust your clinical gestalt and then how much you feel good about the patient's age and their recent viral history. And a lot of times it's a great case of just, if you take a great history and you really can get a sense of that they just had something viral or they just changed medication, you get enough to put this picture together, but it's not often, it's not ever easy, I think. I did find it interesting that in the article, it says that pericarditis has been noted as a cause in about 0.2% of all cardiovascular admissions. That's like two per thousand, which seems kind of low, honestly. My experience, at least in our referral center, which may be skewed, has been that I've seen more episodes of pericarditis than that number necessarily attributes. And I have seen some pretty serious cases of myocarditis as well. well. One case that sticks out in my mind is of a young college student who had a typical viral syndrome, had been continuing to work out and exercise, and then came in in fulminant heart failure and ended up having to get flown to a heart transplant center with the concern that maybe he was going to require a transplant if he didn't show some kind of improvement. It was terrible. So the severity of these cases is quite wide ranging when we talk about the differences between the two diagnoses. But I was very happy to see the article. Once again, it is very well researched. It is founded in evidence-based medicine. And the authors, and for this article, there were four of them, this is Dr. Morgan McGuire, Dr. Warren Harvey, Dr. Tucker Brady, and Dr. Alexandre Nguyen are all did an outstanding job of significant deep dive into the literature for this review. So again, everything published from 2015 to 2023, about 669 articles all summarized for you here on the podcast, but also in the article in the app for you to use while you're on shift. The definitions that we should get out of the way are the two things that differentiate pericarditis and myocarditis. So there is a pericardium that is the lining around the heart. There is the visceral layer and the parietal layer. That's the two layers, one against the heart and one on the outside. And between the two, there is normally anywhere from 15 to 50 milliliters of fluid, which is considered to be just be physiologic. 
when that fluid accumulates quickly, even 100 milliliters can be quite symptomatic and start to cause tamponade where the ventricles are no longer able to expand fully and fill with blood. But if it accumulates slowly, you can get massive effusions. So up to 1,500 milliliters can be in that space as long as it is gradually accumulating and then the pericardium just stretches and the body compensates. Myocarditis, on the other hand, is an inflammation of the myocardium or the heart muscle. And that can be as a result of progression from pericarditis to myocarditis, or it can be the start of the process, and then it can go myocardium to pericardium, or it can just be isolated myocarditis. The caveat there being that typically when you have pericardial involvement, you've got pain and discomfort and maybe some pleuritic irritation. When you take deep breaths, it's causing you to have increasing pain. That's not necessarily the case if you have just isolated myocarditis. Usually those are the patients who are coming in with more exertional shortness of breath and by the time they see you are having the heart failure type symptoms. So, But not as much of the acute pain. You, you raise a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not really so much chest pain, uh, but it is a spectrum. So in the cardiology field, they have multiple terms like myopericarditis or perimyocarditis, which is really just the thought process of where it started and where it went to, starting with myopericarditis, which is it begins in the myocardium and goes to the pericardium, and then perimyocarditis, which is it starts in the pericardium and moves inward to the myocardium. And then there are terms like, like cardiac MRI diagnosis. I feel like whichever one's more irritated on the cardiac MRI, because I always see that in the hospitalist notes, Sam, when I'm following these up and I'm like, how do they know? And now that I've seen these pictures of the cardiac MRI, I'm like, you know, I bet that's how they know. I bet the MRI is more inflamed in one or the other. And the radiologist makes a call and everybody goes, oh, yes, this is perimyocarditis or this mm -hmm. is myopericarditis, obviously. Well, honestly, I'm not even sure that distinction even is clinically relevant, but it exists anyway in the literature. And for the nomenclature, that's what it means. And then there is an entity called inflammatory cardiomyopathy, which is myocarditis in association with cardiac dysfunction. So these are people who are symptomatic. And then there's fulminant myocarditis, which is the one thing you probably don't want anybody to diagnose you with. And this is sudden and severe myocarditis that results in cell death, edema, and usually cardiogenic shock. So you could have, for example, pericarditis and then get diagnosed with perimyocarditis and then turn into an inflammatory cardiomyopathy and then get diagnosed with fulminant myocarditis. This is really just kind of a spectrum of the disease process, but that's the purpose behind this terminology. For our sake, what we're really most concerned about is how do we make the diagnosis is it just isolated to the pericardium or is it in the myocardium? And then what's the disposition or treatment going to be? When we talk about pericarditis, there are some, again, outstanding tables. So I want you to go and take a look at the article. Page five has all of the potential etiologies for pericardial disease. So this is isolated disease of the pericardium. And these are broken down into the infectious and non-infectious causes. So Infectious causes being viruses, things like enterovirus, COVID-19, parvovirus, adenovirus, herpes viruses, uh, bacterial infections. There are a lot of them. Everything from strep and staph to pneumococcal and meningococcal infections, fungal infections, and parasitic infections even. Toxoplasma gondii and echinococcus. And then there are the non-infectious causes. So People with autoimmune disease like lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis are all prone to having pericarditis. Neoplastic disease, especially if they're getting treated for cancer, that can actually be from the cancer itself or it can be from the medication being used, so chemotherapy induced. And then metabolic causes like uremia and myxedema. Traumatic causes, obviously, if you have penetrating thoracic injury, that'll give you a, a pericarditis, although really in that kind of case, if you're thinking of hemopericardium and, and tamponade, we don't usually think about that in the same differential, but it is in there. This table brought me back down to earth a little bit because it reminded me of some of the patients that I'm not even really thinking about that I need to be more cautious about. I, I don't think it was really well in my head that some of my patients that have Parkinson's and are on methyl dopa could possibly be getting pericarditis. I definitely didn't clearly have it in my head 
that all of my patients that I see on a regular basis for their dialysis, that if they start talking about chest pain, I need to really remember that, oh yeah, this could be pericarditis from that. And I need mm -hmm. to consider that EKG because that's just, that's a quick test that you can get that really helps you determine if there's something changing about them. And, mm -hmm. and there's a number of medicines like Amio and hydrolysine and sulfa. And for me, have having been in rural places where I gave a lot of streptokinase for a lot of MIs, that's something that if you're seeing someone that, that is now you're receiving them in a hospital and they got streptokinase or maybe they got admitted somewhere because they couldn't get to you and now they're getting transferred because they're getting worse. And that's what's happening is now they've got not necessarily worsening cardiac ischemia, but a pericarditis from the streptokinase that they got. It, it gave me just a, it tried to get me to expand my mind about these patients that you need to really cast a broad loop and really have a clear sense of when it's a good idea to go further with that chest pain, because they don't always have to be the kind of classic ischemic risk factor pictures. You need to consider what else can I do to help these people? What else is causing it? Yeah. And so interesting that aortic dissection makes this list. You know, I don't actually think about aortic dissection as being a cause for pericarditis as much as I think of it as you have a dissection that just ruptures into your pericardium and then you bleed to death or you suddenly have tamponade and now that's it. It's over at that point. I don't really think of that as pericarditis, but technically, I guess it does cause inflammation and pain and it's in the pericardial sac. So, so there it is. One more diagnosis. Also, having, added to the having seen a couple of these cases, I wonder how much of that is, is related to the fact that they can have it post-surgical because they go yeah. in and have to basically get reconnected and have some surgery in the area where then they can have some post-surgical pericardial inflammation. I could see it kind of being on the front or the back end for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When it comes to trying to make this diagnosis, there are criteria, and they're nicely listed there in Table 2, same page, on page 5. And for us, it's important to remember that you only need two of the four criteria to make this diagnosis. And they are pericarditic chest pain, which is usually pleuritic, typically worse when you lay flat, better when you lean forward. Second, a pericardial rub on auscultation. Third, new widespread ST elevation or PR depression on the EKG. And lastly, new or worsening pericardial effusion that you would see on echo or bedside point of care ultrasound. And you only need two of those. So technically speaking, somebody has pericarditic chest pain and you hear a rub, that's totally enough to make that diagnosis. Or if they have that kind of chest pain and you see the changes on ECG, that's also enough. You don't have to have all four of them. But those are the criteria for making the diagnosis. When it comes to myocarditis, so this is when you're actually getting inflammation of the muscle, the myocardium itself, this is thought to be about one to four weeks, typically after a viral illness, if it has a viral etiology. But honestly, the evidence here is pretty slim. Most of it is case reports, observational data. We don't have as much data in this diagnosis as we do for pericarditis. The underlying causes are still divided into categories like infectious, immune-mediated, or toxic as a result of medications. And again, figure three delineates the kinds of things that can give you myocarditis. A bunch of viruses. There are some parasitic things like schistosomiasis that can cause it. There are multiple bacterial agents, again, streptococcal species, mycoplasma, mycobacterium, uh, fungal agents, protozoal agents, and then there are toxins, cocaine being one of them. So you can get a cocaine-induced myocarditis, hypersensitivity reactions to things like antibiotics, cephalosporins, sulfonamides, tricyclic antidepressants, diuretics, digoxin. I mean, these are patients who would normally be on these medications for cardiac reasons, now having chest pain, and you go, oh, okay, this is ACS. But actually, it could be the medication we've been giving them causing a myocarditis. And then the immune-mediated things. Interestingly, diabetes mellitus is listed as one of those immunological syndromes. And so just the presence of diabetes and chest pain with inflammatory markers may be sufficient to make that diagnosis. It just, it feels like so much of this disease is just us supporting them. But as you said, this is something that I fear as a physician being diagnosed with, but it broadened my sense that there is a lot of this that is viral, but there's a lot of other causes to this. And it made me broaden my scope of this is what I think this is. I think it's myocarditis. I think it's pericarditis. But as far as what is causing it, it really has opened a much bigger differential for me once I'm there of 
okay, how far do I need to go? What else do I need to ask about? Do I need to send my medical student or my resident back in to really sit down for an hour and really go through to see <laughs> what we can tease out about this? Because there, there is a lot here that you've got to work through to try to figure out what's driving this disease. And especially because I think that we think of this as like the initial presentation, but that also really came out in this article that a lot of times you'll meet these people at some point in the spectrum of mm-hmm. progression of their disease, not necessarily just the initial pericarditis or the fulminant myocarditis, but sometime in that middle period. And I think that there are opportunities there to figure out what's driving this and figure out what's making it worse or to figure out what you could do to treat them and make it better. And that's the way that I look at this now coming away from this article. Yeah, and that's a really good point, actually, because myocarditis itself as a disease entity does have three defined phases. That's also in figure four, page six. Phase one being the direct damage from the medication or toxin or, or whatever is causing the inflammatory response. Phase two has actually a divergence there because it either progresses to healed myocarditis or chronic myocarditis. And then phase three is progression of chronic myocarditis into some kind of chronic microbial or chronic immune-mediated or chronic autoreactive myocarditis and a dilated cardiomyopathy. So we can capture patients anywhere on this spectrum. They may have had chest pain for a while, and you're going, oh, this is clearly not ACS. Like, What are you doing here? And the answer could be, well, you might actually be in phase two or phase three of your myocarditis, and no one has picked up on that diagnosis until now when you're so symptomatic that you've got a cardiomyopathy. And I think this was in my head as either or. It was, it's one of these or it's the other. And I thought this figure especially made a great case of once now you've inflamed the heart and released all these antigens, you can have bacterial damage or the bacterial damage can then institute an autoimmune picture and you can get damage from both. So even though you've treated the infection and you think, oh, I've handled the infection or the virus that's caused this, then you can have an autoimmune period of your myocarditis where now you've got to consider how to manage that. And it, it again gave me a clearer sense that like this is a spectrum. This is a continuum mm-hmm. of disease from the standpoint of progression and from cause. And it can worsen not because the original cause was still there or still the problem, but because then, you know, you get an autoimmune reaction and more. So it, again, it just every time you get a chance to intervene for these people, every time you get a chance to to consider, well, do we need to send blood cultures? Do we need to send more autoimmune labs? It made me want to be more aggressive. Yeah. When we talk about disease processes, we're always considering differential diagnoses, and there is a beautiful list there in table four. It's really all things chest pain. We've reviewed that multiple times on the podcast, so we won't go through it today, but just keep in mind that whenever you're seeing someone with chest pain, even if you are entertaining the diagnosis or think it's strongly suggestive that they have pericarditis, you do need to keep in mind the typical things that are responsible for the vast majority of presentations, like acute coronary syndromes and pulmonary emboli and aortic dissections and all of those things. For our colleagues in the pre-hospital setting, there isn't a whole lot that you're going to be able to do to distinguish pericarditis and myocarditis and ACS, acute MI, those kinds of things in the field other than a 12-lead ECG. If your 12-lead is diagnostic of an MI, then there you go. There's your answer. If your 12-lead is non-diagnostic, then, you know, sometimes those ECG changes are subtle. If you're looking at diffuse ST elevation in all of the leads, or even if it's patterned, but there's no reciprocal depression, and maybe the pain is a little bit atypical, has been going on longer than usual, or is positional, you might entertain the diagnosis of pericarditis, but it's going to be really hard. You're not going to make that diagnosis in the field. You're still following protocols. You're still treating them symptomatically. Obviously, if you're catching them on the fulminant myocarditis portion of their disease process. These people are decompensating. Hypotensive and cardiogenic shock can be exceptionally hard to manage. Mm. If they are post-diagnosis, have the cardiomyopathy, already have the LVAD in place, and have known cardiac disease, even more complex patients. So it is just straight resuscitation, continuing with your protocols. If they have an LVAD, make sure that's functioning and turned on and the battery pack is charged and there's power and it's working and so on and so forth. So there's a a wide spectrum here, but very hard to make that distinction in the back of an ambulance. Don't don't leave their millerinone drip at home if they've got it sitting there next to them. That's That's never going to work well. But but again, I think coming from the rural places, if you've got half an hour transport with someone like this, and it's a chest pain and you get a chance to talk to them about the history and things like that, 
starting to, to really tease out some of the history and getting as much as you can for the next provider down the road really helps. I think from my standpoint in the last year, I've seen people with acute onset chest pain where I was sure it was ACS and it became pericarditis and myocarditis, mm -hmm. most often pericarditis. But that has really humbled me because I really had it in my head. It had to be something that came out gradually. And I've seen two or three people now come in, sudden onset of chest pain, telling a good story for ACS. And their EKG over the hours starts with some segmental ST elevation in places where I can convince myself it's a heart attack, but it turns into their whole EKG over time. Mm -hmm. And that has, again, humbled me just to the fact that this is challenging. So you work in parallel, like you can manage both of those, those options as you go forward. Exactly. Absolutely. In the ED, we're looking at your typical history, maybe spending a little bit more time on potential causes. So screening them for recent viral infections, recent bacterial infections, new medications, new exposures, maybe travel, even travel outside the country, especially if you're entertaining something that might be parasitic, and vaccine history. Now in the post-COVID era with our COVID vaccines, if they had something like that recently, those can also be a cause for pericarditis and myocarditis and should be entertained. And all of that becomes relevant. Hopefully, it's not going to take too long to get that history from them, but it, it's just something you have to add to your normal chest pain questionnaire. I'm, I'm excited and, and ready for my first patient that comes in that's been taking high-dose minoxidil that they got off the internet for their thinning hair and has now developed pericarditis. I'm ready to make that diagnosis and treat appropriately. And I will say that I had a veteran when I was in medical school that I remember who got a kidney transplant and got put on immune suppression. And mm. because he had been in the South Pacific as a veteran, had a chronic but well-managed by his immune system trypanosomal infection, that then once he got put on the immune suppressants for his new kidney, just completely exploded wow. and, and developed all through his body. So I think wow. noting changes that you wouldn't necessarily think would be the thing that causes it. Putting that picture together is really what's going to make these diagnoses for you. And it's a great go back to the bedside and just keep asking questions until it makes sense. That's right. And when you're asking the patient about the description of the pain, the typical descriptors are things like sharp stabbing sensations that are precordial or retrosternal, sudden or gradual onset. If they're going to radiate, they're going to radiate to the same location as ACS. So back, neck, arm, shoulder, if they're aggravated, it's typically by things like deep inspiration or movement and relieved by leaning forward. And sometimes if they're in the acute phase and it's viral or infectious, they've got a fever, they can have some shortness of breath. They can even have some pain with swallowing. You know, that pericardial sac sits on the lower esophagus. And so that can cause further irritation and pressure when you're swallowing boluses down your esophagus and it's pushing on the back of the pericardium. So those are some of the interesting things you might elicit on history. And when it comes to physical exam, the most important thing is this statement from the article. Overall, physical examination findings alone do not lend enough specificity to confirm the diagnosis of myocarditis. And it's the same for pericarditis. So when you're looking at exam findings, there are multiple different things reported in studies. The overall sensitivities and specificities are pretty low. There are some that have better specificity in the pediatric population, things like tachypnea or tachycardia, but again, they're not very specific. For physical exam on this, it, it reaffirmed my sense that there's nothing on physical exam that's really going to tell you definitively this is pericarditis or myocarditis, but we're chasing zebras here. And that's what you've got to enjoy about these cases is that you're going to rule out ACS. That chest pain radiating to the back, you're going to take the picture to rule out the dissection. You're going to make sure it's not pancreatitis. You know your bread and butter. But the reason you're doing this exam is to put all the pieces together that manage to make this something. You're looking at the rash because now having seen someone that had Neisseria meningitis bacteremia, but not meningitis, if I saw that rash and a, a person with chest pain, I'd say, wow, this is Neisseria meningitis in the blood and... It's also now giving pericarditis, like I'm more worried about that. In my patient that is worried about high-risk sexual behaviors, that's then bouncing back, maybe they took their antibiotics, maybe they're not, because that weak doxycycline is hard. Now I'm more worried that this is a chlamydial pericarditis. If they've got that big bullseye rash coming from the Northeast, where everyone was very worried about Lyme disease, now I'm more interested in that their heart block seeming like it's a new thing and it's not a part of their chronic cardiac history. Like, it's, yeah. it's the 
this is a fun kind of joy of medicine thing. And it's a way to make the young person coming in with chest pain that otherwise I think in our jaded part of our career, when we get tired of it, it's a way to look at them and say, all right, this is a good challenge because if I put a little bit of focus and a little attention into this and I go a little further, then there's one oyster to uncover there that all of a sudden is going to have the answer and you're going to get a chance to do some things to fix this person. Exactly. And as the article says, they might have tachypnea, they might have tachycardia, they might have fever, they might have all of these different physical exam findings, but none of them are very specific. So you do have to just take it in context as a sum of the total, but you're still going to proceed down your normal diagnostic testing route. And speaking of diagnostic testing, there are some things that you should be getting. Of course, everyone's going to get an ECG. So you're going to be looking for that ST segment elevation. It's typically concave, typically diffuse, and without reciprocal changes. And there's always the stipulation that it's typically this because that just means there's going to be atypical cases. You may find AV blocks, new AV blocks. You might have dysrhythmias, things like new onset AFib may not just be simple AFib. It might be myocarditis causing AFib. So you still got to ask those questions. If they have a ventricular tachycardia or dysrhythmia, that can also be as a result of myocarditis. And those findings can be associated with worse outcomes. So there was one specific study. It was retrospective. This was 9,200 patients with myocarditis who had an associated dysrhythmia the most commonly recognized was AFib, and that was in a quarter of them, followed by VTAC, and that was almost another quarter. And these patients were more likely to require a longer hospital stay, an implanted defibrillator, or a pacemaker. And that difference was statistically significant. So if they have those dysrhythmias and they have myocarditis, it doesn't mean you're just going to treat the myocarditis and ignore the dysrhythmia. These are actually sicker people and more likely to go on to need more invasive therapy. And the same if they had QRS or QTC prolongation. Those patients also specifically had a worse prognosis. So if they have changes on the ECG or new dysrhythmias, that puts them at higher risk, but that's going to be your starting place for diagnostic evaluation. And especially in people you're worried about or people that look unwell, they're diaphoretic, they're short of breath, you're worried they're getting worse, repeated EKGs. It doesn't yes. have to wait two hours. I would tell you that an EKG in 15 to 30 to 60 minutes has been my friend more times than I'm comfortable admitting because the initial EKG doesn't always paint the picture that you need it to, but boy, does the repeat bail you out sometimes. I'll tell you, it's it's funny because you it's pretty easy to anchor on something. I have had conversations with my cardiology colleagues where I have sent them an EKG and said, hey, this is a concerning case. Here's why. Here's the EKG. And they'll go, ah, you know, this isn't really as impressive. And that sets that anchor point. And then Five minutes later, I send another one and I go, here's number two. And they go, yeah, okay, maybe it's a little worse. And then five minutes later, I send the third one. They go, yeah, okay. And, and I had this happen. Then one of their colleagues comes in to see the patient, right? Because they called someone else. Okay, the ER keeps bugging me about this person. Please go see them. And their colleague will look at this and go, they'll start on the third one and go, holy cow, this looks terrible. I'll say, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. And they'll say, oh, well, well, why, why isn't somebody doing something? I said, well, I did call your partner and I showed him number one and then number two and then number three. And they go, oh gosh, this is just progressing. Like, what, what are we doing here? And I go, exactly. And so it's, it's easy to anchor on that first, maybe mildly abnormal ECG and then not see the progression and not flip that switch in your brain that goes, oh, this is, this is progressing for a reason and this is not normal. So just one more thing we have to combat in our own brains as we're trying to treat these patients. All right, laboratory testing. So obviously we're doing troponin testing. No one's going to get out of the ER with chest pain without having a troponin. Interesting. Yes, Sam, troponin was going to save me every time. The troponin <laughs> every time was never going to be negative in myocarditis. This blew my mind. You're telling me the number is 50%. I'm, 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 so I'm blowing your, your intro to this up. 50% of the time, myocarditis has a negative troponin. Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah, what, no. what you, I was so I, disappointed. Isn't, that, isn't the person <laughs> leaking into the blood? I understand how the proponents work. It's right. there. It gets, the heart gets inflamed. It leaks out. What do you mean half the time it's not there? Well, two Where'd caveats for that, right? First, this, this data is based on the older troponin assays, not the high sensitivity troponins that we have nowadays. So just anecdotally, I think people are much more likely to have an elevated high sensitivity troponin for any reason nowadays. And so 
with that increased sensitivity, there comes an increased ability to pick this diagnosis up if they actually have true myocarditis. But this particular statistic does draw attention to the fact that this is an inflammatory process. And if you're trying to diagnose an inflammatory process, the troponin isn't necessarily your gold standard. You're looking for things that are very nonspecific, like your sed rate and your C-reactive protein, which are the two blood tests that your cardiology colleagues will continue to follow after the diagnosis has been made to determine when it's okay to stop treatment. So if they're going to start them on medication, which we'll talk about in a minute, they're going to continue to follow these levels till they're normal and then take the person off of their meds. So if you're entertaining this diagnosis, you're not only going to get a troponin. Or if you get an abnormal troponin, you might consider adding these. Again, they're very nonspecific, but it was very interesting to see that in the literature, the troponin is only elevated 50% of the time. That's very disappointing. <laughs> I would tell you that, again, meeting these people where they're in their spectrum of disease, if they were just here a week ago, they got a troponin and it was elevated. I think I'd still want to see one now. And then this is the kind of case where I at least want to talk to cardiology because you're, like I said, we're chasing zebras. And then the other part of this that from laboratory testing that I took away from this was this isn't all viral. So I'm sending blood cultures on these people now because I think that that's the only way you're going to catch some of these rare softer bacterial infections that don't give you like a really good fever. Your listerias, like a lot of the bacterial infections that we talked about here, it made me want to do an RPR and it made me want to do blood cultures on these people because I think that that some of the people now in my practice, I'm more worried about trying to catch in these kind of pericarditis, myocarditis pictures. So interesting. I think the indication for blood culture has gone along with the indication for troponin in the emergency department. With the federal government focused on sepsis core measures so much, we seem to be getting blood cultures at the drop of a pin, much like now we do with troponins. So yeah, I, if you're entertaining a diagnosis of an infection, absolutely, I would consider adding blood cultures. There are some other things you can do. BNP or brain natriuretic peptide can sometimes be elevated if they are starting to progress in the severity of their disease. You can also get a differential for your CBC. There is this entity called eosinophilic myocarditis. And in that scenario, the differential would show a predominance of eosinophils greater than 75%. And that can be suggestive, again, not diagnostic, but suggestive for the patient where you're entertaining that as a diagnosis. And maybe not even something you're going to put together, but something for your cardiology colleagues to put together when they look at the SED rate, the CRP, the troponin, the eosinophilia on their differential. These things eventually form a picture on the inpatient side, but just important to keep that as a possibility for your labs. They're also going to get all the other routine labs looking at kidney function. Are they in new onset renal failure? Might they fall into that uremia category? So all of those typical things you would get for someone with chest pain in the emergency department. And then we're going to move on to imaging. Imaging is a basket of lots of different kinds of things that we can order. We start with plain films. We talk about CT scans. We talk about point-of-care ultrasound and formal echocardiography and MRI imaging, all of which can be pertinent for this diagnosis. I'm, I, I'm just throwing out the chest x-rays on these people, Sam. I'm going straight to cardiac MRI. Honestly, <laughs> I, I, my takeaway from this was great, which is it reaffirmed my practice that if you're worried that they've got pericarditis, or you think that even they're starting to show you some degree of myocarditis, the point of care ultrasound can tell you a lot because you just drop that probe on there. You're not trying to give a, a, a real assessment of what exactly is their EF, but if their heart is barely moving and there's a lot of fluid around there, you need to be much more concerned about these people and you need to make everybody else aware of your concern. If we only had a point of care MRI, things would be so much easier. So my curious guy question on this, because this paper just continued to make my curious guy just, just sit there and be like, how does that work? A cardiac MRI, how do you effectively take something that's probably angry and beating it like, you know, 100, 110, 120 beats a minute because you've got this inflamed heart? And how do you get good MRI pictures? Do you beta block them and slow them down enough that you can get better pictures? Like, how do you do it? Well, let's just start by saying I don't know. I know that there are gating software packages where the computer takes into effect the respiratory motion and tries to filter that out by compensating for movement for respirations. 
and tries to give you kind of a less blurry, more steady state picture of what this would look like. And how that translates to MRI, you know, for example, when we're doing coronary CT, we've got to slow people down ideally to a heart rate of around 60. I, I honestly, I don't know if that applies to cardiac MRI. I would think so, uh, but, uh, but I don't know. That's an excellent question. I'm going to ask our radiologist when I get to work. But it does bring up a good point that cardiac MRI is now becoming the gold standard for this diagnosis when endocardial biopsy used to be the gold standard. So these people would all go get heart caths and a biopsy of their myocardium to prove that it was inflamed and make the diagnosis of myocarditis. But obviously that comes with a lot of potential for badness. And if you have the choice between an invasive procedure or a cardiac MRI, more people are choosing to go down the MRI route, and there's been increasing evidence that that's adequate. And so now MRI is becoming the gold standard and is even the recommendation by the European Society of Cardiology opposed to endomyocardial biopsy. You can, you can sign me up for the tunnel of truth over the punch biopsy of my heart. I'm, yes. I'm going to go, go that way every time. Any day. Chest x-ray has been found to be abnormal in 50% of the cases of myocarditis, but not because it's diagnostic of myocarditis, because oh. it can show, but because it can show you things like pulmonary edema, maybe a large cardiac silhouette, maybe the presence of a pericardial effusion. So it can be abnormal half of the time, but not necessarily specific to the diagnosis you're entertaining. Point of care ultrasound is excellent. And I was very happy to see that there was actually a study that resident physicians had a 93% agreement with board-certified cardiologists in assessing the visual estimation of just ejection fraction. That's helpful if they're not known to have a cardiomyopathy and you can see a markedly reduced ejection fraction. That certainly heightens your concern for myocarditis. So point-of-care ultrasound can also tell you if they've got a large pericardial effusion and if they've got tamponade physiology with that effusion. So a very, very helpful first look. And then at some point, they're going to get their cardiac MRI. And what they're looking for on the MRI is T2-weighted signal intensity increase in the pericardium or the myocardium, suggesting edema, and then increased global myocardial early gadolinium enhancement as a ratio between the myocardium and skeletal muscle. And then third, at least one focal lesion with non-ischemic regional distribution uh, on the late imaging or the enhanced phase of the gadolinium contrast. So all that to say is they have multiple things they're looking for when they're making this diagnosis. It is ideally a contrasted study, and it is assessing where the contrast is going. It is assessing edema and enhancement of pericardium and myocardium, and also trying to differentiate ischemic changes from inflammatory changes. So I have never had to sit next to a radiologist while they're interpreting one of these studies, but there are some really good images in figure seven that show you what the types of things you might find on MRI would look like and how they can be abnormal. Now, these are, I would say, markedly abnormal images. So they're there for teaching purposes. I'm sure they're not all this dramatic, but if you take a look, there are some excellent pictures there of what some of that enhancement looks like in the pericardium and that outer portions of the myocardium. It's pretty dramatic. I think this maybe did put that in my head. As you work longer and longer on this, you get more and more of a sense of where the workup needs to go for some of these patients. And if someone's coming in and they were admitted for myocarditis and now they're stable, but they say they're getting worse and they never got an MRI, that's something that I think would interest me in saying, you know, do we need to bring this person in to repeat their echo, maybe get them a cardiac MRI, maybe see if we can do a little more to figure this out? Is it the fact that now they're going from their initial infectious cause to a more autoimmune cause? Given that this is now the gold standard, it made me want to make sure that these kind of patients, when they come and they rarely are going to show up on your doorstep, that you try to work them up as much as you can because they need it. And, you know, until... MRI becomes so prevalent that every one of those rural hospitals has one and is able to get one 24 hours a day, you're going to be making this determination with your cardiology colleagues. This is not something you're going to order from the emergency department. Even if you're running your own ED OBS unit, you're going to consult the cardiologist and let them decide when an MRI is indicated. Just because it's a lengthy study, it's an expensive study, and in most places, it isn't readily available. Sometimes that involves a transfer. And then the question becomes, could they get this as an outpatient? Is it going to make a difference as far as their treatment goes? Or is this more for diagnostic purposes? Should we just start initiating treatment now and then 
make the diagnosis a little later. So it just begs more questions. Having had the MRI used to roll up on Monday or Tuesday in some of my rural hospitals in a trailer and it would pull in and then they would set it up and they'd do MRIs for a couple of days and then move to the other hospital in the next county over. I think that this is the time where you want to get them to a tertiary care center yeah. and make sure that they get a real good cardiac MRI and see cardiology and get tuned up as much as they can. Not the trailer MRI, is that what you're saying? I, I, I would tell you that I, I love those trailer MRIs because boy, <laughs> they help you not have to transfer a lot of people for things. But I think these are the people that they need to go and see all the people with all the very, very specialized training. Don't get me wrong. We are not making fun of the people who own or work in those trailer MRIs. We appreciate oh, no, you no, very that, much. Uh, that was an incredible thing. It, it saved me from transferring so many strokes. Yeah, it, it gave me ways of finding things that, that I never would have been able to find and really made a huge difference. And, and for people that I couldn't transfer, it gave me a way of working them up further without doing that because of a storm or something else. But yeah. I still think it's worth knowing that this is a specialized test that needs to be done carefully. All right. And then we move on to treatment. So the whole point of doing all of this to make the diagnosis is to initiate the right treatment. And the treatment for an inflammatory condition is going to be anti-inflammatories. So the standard first-line treatment for pericarditis is going to be NSAIDs, things like aspirin or ibuprofen. It doesn't have to be some prescription NSAID. It can be over-the-counter. The typical dosing for aspirin is anywhere from 650 to 1,000 milligrams every eight hours, or ibuprofen, 600 milligrams every eight hours, perfectly okay, and are actually recommended by the European Society of Cardiology as the first-line therapy. And they're typically going to be on this therapy for one to two weeks as cardiology continues to follow their inflammatory markers to make sure that they're responding. And then they're going to begin to taper the dosing over another two to four weeks. So they're going to be on a long course of high dose NSAIDs. If they need PPI or GI prophylaxis, you're going to have to go ahead and start that as well. But this is not a short course. This is not, here's a week of ibuprofen. Goodbye. Have a nice day. And if there is a contraindication to NSAIDs, there are multiple other options, corticosteroids being one of them. Interestingly, Glucocorticoid therapy, if used early in the course of disease, has been shown to be a predictor of recurrence. So avoiding those for first-line therapy and just using NSAIDs is ideal. But if you have no choice, something as simple as oral prednisone, low dose at 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, is perfectly sufficient and has been shown to help. And again, they'll follow those inflammatory markers. And then there's colchicine. And colchicine is interesting because it's added to NSAID therapy. It's been shown to be beneficial in a controlled trial of 120 patients with various forms of pericarditis. If colchicine was given in addition to aspirin during that initial first visit or that index visit for pericarditis, then it prevented recurrence with a number needed to treat of five, which is exceptionally that's an, low. That's an astonishing number needed to treat. Yeah. And I really love number needed to treats because I think we should be we should be more focused on this in medicine. If we have a if we have a treatment that's got that good of an NMT, we these are the kind of things that we should really be trying to do more of. And this completely changed my practice. I'm now going to add colchicine to every single patient that that I'm sending home with pericarditis. Yeah. And Colchicine is dosed based on body weight. And so if they're greater than 70 kilograms, the suggested dose is 0.6 milligrams twice a day. If they're less than 70 kilograms, you're going to be getting that once a day. And then there also is IVIG therapy. Now, this is kind of branching off into some of the more extreme causes of myocarditis and pericarditis, but there is IVIG therapy, there's azathioprine, and there's anakinra all of which can be considered as long as the person has proven non-infectious recurrent pericarditis. And typically those are used in someone where corticosteroid therapy is contraindicated for some reason. And so again, this is well beyond the scope of the emergency department, but just so you're aware, those are the kinds of things that are medical therapies for pericarditis, recurrent pericarditis. And of course, if they have pericardial effusion that becomes symptomatic, then that's an indication to go and get a pericardial window, and that will be the surgical therapy. I think from my takeaway on this this treatment part, I I really just think that 
as, as much as you can limit the amount of times you're asking a patient to take medicine a day, it really helps. So I'm leaning towards naproxen for these patients because it doesn't seem like there's a big difference in NSAIDs. And I think if you can give somebody something twice a day with something like you said for GI prophylaxis, because they're going to be on this for a while, and then take their dose from 500 down to 250 after two weeks, I think that really seems like it's the where I'm going to go coming off this. And then adding on the colchicine twice a day. And then the, the steroid takeaway, I just, I think when I'm listening to podcasts, I want them to give me kind of exact doses sometimes to help me kind of make it stick in my brain. The steroid dose really humbled me and backed me up a little bit because I think I would have been thinking to start a little higher. And mm -hmm. they're talking about for a 70 kilogram person starting between 14 and 35 milligrams. So 10 to 40 is what you're actually going to be prescribing with like 20 kind of being the sweet spot. That's really my takeaway is that I was probably going to start people at 20 yeah, and then send them home with that and then, and then basically have them go up or down. And I think that's half, if not a third of where I was thinking I was at before this. So I think sometimes when you're busy, you're shooting from the hip, you're just trying to like make sure you get it taken care of. This made me want to taper that dose back for my patients with pericarditis that are on a blood thinner or have kidney disease that I can't give them. And then said, I'm going to start low with steroids, but I'm going to give them the colchicine. seat. Yeah. Yeah. It's low dose for sure. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. If they have myocarditis, then it's typically supportive care and then treating all of the sequelae of the disease. So we've got things like dysrhythmias and cardiomyopathies and heart failure and ventricular dysfunction and all of those things that have been very well studied in congestive heart failure. So you're going to go down those pathways for supportive care. They're all going to get guideline or goal-directed therapy for things like managing their dysrhythmia, for things like managing their heart failure. They might need temporary or permanent placement of a pacemaker or a defibrillator, depending on the type of block they have. And all of those things are going to be managed by our cardiology colleagues. There's very, very little evidence for anything like corticosteroids or IVIG or any of those kinds of treatments, even in viral myocarditis. It hasn't been shown to be beneficial to start it up front or even afterwards. And so those therapies are not typically used for myocarditis, but they are used for isolated pericarditis. And if they have something immune-mediated, so like, for example, giant cell or eosinophilic myocarditis, then there is a role for some of those immune suppressants. But otherwise, they're, really, they're not used for myocarditis. And then one of the questions that's always in the back of people's minds when they make this diagnosis, especially in a young person who's an athlete, is, well, when is it safe to return to sports and athletic activity? And the American Heart Association and European Society of Cardiology consensus statements say that anyone who is diagnosed with an acute phase of myocarditis should wait for six months before they return for clearance to go back to any kind of aerobic exercise. And that's six months from the time that they have resolved or recovered their illness. So if you're in this for a month or two before you're finally cleared of the actual problem, then the clock starts and you've got to be symptom-free and have no relapse within six months before you'd be cleared to go back to sports or aerobic activity which, you know, if you're a professional athlete or something of that sort, that's a considerable amount of time. I don't feel like we're seeing these people as much in the emergency room, but I think it's worth starting that conversation if they're coming back and saying, you know, I think I'm good to go. You got to just tell them that this is the rest of their life and they can't stress their heart until it's ready and we need to make sure it's ready before they stress. Yeah, great points. Some special populations for your people in cardiogenic shock. These are very, very sick patients. And if you're not accustomed to managing them in your hospital, you want to get them somewhere where they are accustomed to doing so. Like that case I talked about in the young man who had that severe, severe viral cardiomyopathy, who we had to ship to a, another center from ours, which, you know, ours is quite capable, but, but they weren't ready to do things like heart transplants and LVADs. And, and that's where this guy needed to go. From my takeaway on this, the damage is there. You're really just there to try to basically stop them from decompensating and then try to get them somewhere where they can figure out the rest. But I did find that norepi and then something like either dobutamine or milrinone was the preferred agents. I think that the Cochrane review didn't show clearly that it was, but this at least gave me a starting point that for these kind of patients, I'm going to think norepi and then milrinone or dobutamine to try to, to give them support. And then also this gave me the sense that if this is someone that I've got and they start off a little unstable and then I get them stable, 
I, and I'm transferring them or I'm talking to my cardiologist, do we have the capacity for ECMO? Do we have the capacity to put an LVAD in this person? Because if they might decompensate, we should move them now while they're stable to somewhere that can do all of that. Because I'm not a big ECMO fan for very old, very sick people, but man, for young asthmatics and young people with something like this, like myocarditis, that's really ugly. I think this is what that is made for. And I think that you should get these people somewhere that if, if they can get it, they can get it. Exactly. There is a good section on COVID. We are all just so tired of talking about COVID, but this is just a good one paragraph review. If you are having this conversation with a patient or having this conversation with a family member or even just interested in it for yourself, it's good to know that, yes, there have been cases of myocarditis associated with COVID and with COVID vaccines. What we know about looking at the retrospective data is that there is evidence that mRNA vaccines and the COVID virus can both cause pericarditis and myocarditis. The incidence in the vaccinated group is about one in 100,000, and the incidence in the people who get the acute infection from the virus is about 150 per 100,000. So you're far more likely to get pericarditis or myocarditis from COVID-19 than you are from the vaccine. There is all kinds of data listed there in that paragraph. If you want to go and take a look and do a deeper dive, the highest rates were seen in adolescents and in males in their early 20s. But for our purposes in the emergency department, I think it's relevant to ask that question to everybody, regardless. Have you had a recent URI? Did you get tested for COVID? And to remember that COVID is not the only virus out there that can give you these symptoms and this disease process. And then ask about their vaccination history. All of that becomes relevant. There is an entity in children called MISC, that's multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, and it is a complication of COVID, and it can involve acute myocarditis and myocardial injury. These children are typically very sick and have a multitude of presenting symptoms. So not just your isolated myocarditis, but can also have things like persistent fever, gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal pain, lymphadenopathy, mental status changes, all on top of chest pain and recent respiratory symptoms. And so just know that that entity exists. You're still going to be getting those inflammatory markers, the CRP, the ESR. You will add in these scenarios tests you normally don't order in children, things like a BNP or even a troponin you're going to get an ECG on these patients. And for this particular subset, there is evidence that IVIG and glucocorticoids are helpful. So unlike the adults with myocarditis for other causes, this particular syndrome does respond to IVIG and glucocorticoids. So again, at this point, you're getting your pediatric critical care and cardiology specialists involved. So not something we're doing in the emergency department, but important. I had one case of MISC and one case of Kawasaki's, and they tend to blur together into just a child that looked miserable, just had a lot of irritation of all their, their mucous membranes and just was dehydrated and looked mm -hmm. really sick. And I felt very comfortable just basically ordering all the tests and handing it off to our partners in peds and critical care because these kids need a lot of work. And we talked already about disposition of athletes. So again, if you're, if you're seeing somebody who's an athlete and they're asking you, hey, okay, you just diagnosed me with pericarditis. When am I going to go back to running or professional sports or what have you? The answer is going to be, I don't know. You're going to start treatment and you're going to have follow-up testing with the cardiologist because after you've recovered, they may do things like serial echocardiograms or stress testing or graduated stress testing to see how your heart responds to aerobic activity before they'll clear you to go back to your significant aerobic exercise. And that process takes six months or more. So you can give them that time frame, but it's not definitive. It's really specific to how their body is responding to the disease process and how quickly they recover. Now that's specifically for myocarditis, right? Yes. But pericarditis, I would say I still want them to follow up with their primary doctor and consider cardiology referral if they're having lingering symptoms. Because as we've said in this thing, it's a progression of disease. And I want to make sure that their pericarditis has stopped there and is resolved before they go out and do things that are really competitive. Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent point. In pericarditis, which is typically uncomplicated in adults and can be managed safely as an outpatient, that interval follow-up is important. And so making sure they're taking their meds and they get their follow-up as an outpatient, these are usually 
It's very stable, very hemodynamically normal patients, and that's typically an outpatient follow-up. Absolutely right. There is a subset of patients who are diagnosed with pericarditis who are going to be brought inpatient, and these are the ones with elevated troponin where you're questioning they might have myocarditis associated. If they have underlying cardiomyopathy, if they have intractable chest pain, if they have a presence of a constrictive pericarditis and they need to be monitored, if they have a pericardial effusion and need serial echocardiograms to follow that progression, all of these are patients that you're going to treat as an inpatient as opposed to just sending them home with NSAIDs and having them follow up with their primary. Yeah. Having done this long enough now, it made me remember that sometimes it doesn't have to just be your focus in the ER and then you make a decision. Sometimes for these kids, like they're young or they're teenagers, you can get them a real echo in the emergency room. Yeah. Or you can admit them to OBS and get them an echo. But I've had a few of these where they've been discharged and they come back and now a little worse and you get them the echo quick in the emergency room that they weren't having success getting as an outpatient. And it answers the question of, well, this is getting worse or, oh, this looks beautiful. Like yeah. we're going to be okay. Yeah. And then for your myocarditis patients, these are typically all being admitted. Some can go to an OBS unit if they're very stable and they're getting serial echoes and serial troponin measurements and telemetry. But the ones that have any kind of decompensation, these are going to be inpatients. They've got a decompensation rate of about 30%. And so that's pretty significant. And the reason why we take them all inpatient, and especially if you're going to pursue things like cardiac MRI or even endocardial biopsy, those are all very long tests that result in longer hospitalizations in our sicker patients. And so all of those people are coming to the inpatient setting. That's your disposition. And some of the risk management pitfalls. I thought the, the two things that were huge takeaways for me was the troponin was negative. There's no way this could be myocarditis. I, that has given me pause that like the troponin does not rule out myocarditis. And therefore, if my suspicion is high, or like you said, like this is pericarditis with some higher risk factors, I'm pushing harder to get those admitted now because I want to see more testing. I want to see that cardiac MRI to figure out exactly how inflamed that heart is or is not. And then one other thing that I think is worth bringing up is the patient's on two pressors. There's nothing else that I can do. I'm maxed out. That's why you bring your cardiologist in. Even if you don't necessarily have ECMO, an intraaortic balloon pump can really help. Doing other things to, to support this heart and kind of changing the dynamics of what's happening or changing, you know, which pressors you're using. I think that the more you can load the boat for these the sick myocarditis patient, the better that they're going to do. Yeah. And if all of that decision-making sounds ultra-complicated, there is a great clinical pathway that's in the article that will also be in the interactive clinical pathways available on your mobile device at the bedside that'll walk you through all of that decision-making, what criteria they meet, do they have pericarditis, might they have myocarditis, how sick are they, et cetera. And, and we'll walk you through that disposition. It's a good pathway, and it'll be available in your mobile device when you're listening to this podcast. So... Once again, thank you to the four authors of the article. It really is an excellent review of both of these diagnoses and how we should approach it in the emergency department. That's Dr. McGuire, Dr. Harvey, Dr. Brady, and Dr. Wynn. Thank you so much to all four of you for writing this for us, and thank you to you listening. And just as a reminder, if you're listening from your podcast store, whether that's on your Apple device or your Android or wherever it is you're listening, we appreciate your reviews. So take a moment and give us a little review in the podcast store where you're listening. And that's it. Until next time, everybody. TR, thank you so much. I'm sure it was perimyocarditis and not myopericarditis. Absolutely. On the record. Such a huge difference. <laughs> All right, everybody. Until next time, be safe. And that's a wrap for this episode of Amplify. Please don't forget to rate us in whatever podcast store you are listening or whatever app you are using. And don't forget clinicalpathways.ebmedicine.net and the rest of the resources there at your fingertips in the mobile app. Until next time, everyone, be safe.